Well, good evening to you and a very, very warm welcome to our Carols by Candlelight service for 2021. And it feels uh, especially special to be here this year, having done everything online last year. We've just about got away with being here in person this evening. But welcome to all of you. My name is Isles. I'm the vicar here. Uh, welcome to you if you're here in the building. And welcome to you if you're joining us online as well. We completely understand that plenty of people have chosen to stay uh, at home this evening and watch online, but we really hope that you will feel part of our uh, worship this evening and do join in with the carols and uh, we hope that uh, all the technology works for you and you really feel part of things. It's good at the end of what has been another strange year for all of us to come and celebrate the good news that never changes the good news of Jesus birth that we celebrate at Christmas now just a few housekeeping notices before we properly begin the service the first is that in line with the um, current regulations in, for public places we are asking everyone to keep uh, their mask on throughout the service unless you're exempt then obviously that's fine uh, the choir will be taking their masks off to sing uh, or anyone reading will be also doing that. But other than that, we will be keeping our masks on. Um, there are toilets outside. If you uh, need to use the facilities, just head out to the back of the church and turn left, uh, and there are some loos out there. Um, do make sure you've turned your mobile phone off. Um, <laughs> everyone has a quick check, um, just to save any interruptions. Um, it also needs to be said, because we do have candles lit here this evening, um, that there are emergency exits um, not out of that door, but you can leave by this door or out of the back, um, or those doors kind of to my right, your left as well at the back, do open. And in the event of a fire, um, we would all leave and meet outside the gates um, of the recreation ground just out down the road a little bit. Other than that, um, simply to say that the, the service will kind of go through unannounced. So um, all your instructions, as it were, will be on the screen. Um, the choir will be leading all the congregational carols, but don't necessarily stand every time they stand, because they are singing a couple of solo items as well. Um, but it'll always tell you on the screen if um, this is one to stand and join in with, okay? Um, but other than that, the, the, the service will simply unfold. So, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, as we come here this evening, we gather to remember the Christmas story, the story of how you gave up the glory of heaven and were born to this earth in Jesus, that you might be with us and show us your love. We pray that as we hear the words of scripture and as we sing familiar carols, that we might be reminded of the wonder of Emmanuel, God with us. Amen.
first reading is taken from Isaiah. Thank you very much. The first reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, beginning to read at verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nations and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when the dividing of the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used to bathe and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time forth and forever. The zeal of the Lord of Almighty will accomplish this. The second reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. 
his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to, f to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The third reading is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them.
The fourth reading is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into the heavens, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had they been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told.
The fifth reading is taken from the book of John, chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth.
The sixth reading is taken from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Well, good evening. Um, It's really good to be with you today. Um, Great to be with you watching online um, as well. I'm just going to share a few thoughts based on the Bible readings that we've had this evening. But before uh, I get started, shall we pray? God, I thank you for the message of Christmas. Thank you for the message of hope and peace and love that it brings. And we really need to hear that message afresh tonight. So please speak to us now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So if we uh, haven't met before, uh, my name is Matt. Um, I'm married to Isles, um, the vicar uh, of this church. Um, And and I think many of you will know that Isles has been on maternity leave for um, much of this year. Uh, in, In fact, Isles is actually still technically on Um, maternity leave, not that you would notice um, at the moment. Um, And that is because um, back in April, she gave birth to our daughter, Phoebe Grace. There she is. Now, I know I'm biased, but she is quite cute, right? Okay, I'm not alone. Good. Um, uh, uh, When I was pregnant, uh, there were, of course, loads of practical things um, for us to do to get ready for having a baby. One of the most important jobs, however, was choosing a name. And Arles and I got really stuck on a boy's name. You see, there are actually only two boy's names that we both really liked. We'd already used one of those on Phoebe's older brother. Uh, And the other one was unwittingly stolen by some close friends of ours who'd had a baby boy several months um, before Phoebe was born. So we were actually quite relieved when we found out at 20 weeks that we were having a girl. Um, It wasn't the only reason um, we were quite glad we're having a girl, you know, one of each, and anyway, anyway, um, and we settled on the names Phoebe, which means light, and grace, which is a word that speaks of God's love towards us, it's unmerited kindness uh, and favor, and we very much hope and pray that our little girl will live up to her name, that she will continue to shine with light and with love um, as she grows up. Names are important. And in the second reading we had this evening, we heard this. An angel of the Lord appeared uh, to Joseph in a dream and said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child she is carrying is from God. She will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And what the angel said makes even more sense when you understand that the name Jesus, it's the Greek form of the the Hebrew name Yeshua, Joshua, and both Jesus and Joshua mean God saves, which is why the phrase Jesus saves is so common. It's become pretty much a kind of Christian cliche. It's generated a whole load of memes and cartoons and other jokes. Here are just a few examples. I particularly like the one in the middle. Jesus, save me. JPEG or PDF. Um, If you're a Manchester City fan, are there any Manchester City fans? Absolutely nobody is admitting to that. But you might have seen something like this because they have a player called 
Jesus. Yeah, anyway, um, who's bailed them out on more than one occasion. But, see, that Bible reading actually goes on, and it gives us a second name for Jesus. Now, this wasn't a name that Jesus was actually called while he lived on earth, but it's a name by which many people now refer to him, and it is profoundly precious. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. See, that is the extraordinary claim that Christians make about Jesus. That he is not just a moral teacher. He is not just a good man. He's not just a great example to follow, although he is all of those things. But he is God, the creator of the entire universe, taking up residence among us as a, as a squalling baby who needs his nappy changing, just like our daughter Phoebe does. Our reading from John said, the word, Jesus, was with God. The word was God. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. There's another translation um, that I love, puts it like this. It says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. There is no other religion or philosophy on earth that claims exactly the same thing. A Muslim might regard Jesus as a prophet. But for them to say that Jesus was God would be considered profoundly blasphemous. If you were an ancient Greek, you'd have had no problem at all with God becoming, uh, you know, God appearing on earth as, as, a, as a man. But it would only be a temporary disguise. It wouldn't be the real thing. Other philosophies would say, well, God is inside you. Or they might say, there is no God. Or they might say, well, God is if he's there, he's unknowable. But Christianity says this. This is, again, this is from John's Gospel, just after the part we read earlier. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And that's all very lovely, you might say. Um, honestly, does it even matter if it's true or not? I mean, what possible relevance could it have to us here in New Malden in the middle of a pandemic in 2021 that God decided to become a baby in a shed in Bethlehem two millennia ago? I mean, you know, other than giving us uh, an excuse to pig out on too much chocolate and mince pies and watch Die Hard and do all the other festive things that we, we love to do, what difference does it make? I want to briefly suggest four ways uh, in which Jesus being Emmanuel, God with us, might make a difference to us now. And they come from our first reading from Isaiah, who gives us four more names for Jesus. He writes this, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he will be called, the words from the first song that the choir sang, wonderful counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So Jesus is God with us as a wonderful counselor. Now, I don't know what association kind of springs to your mind um, with the word counselor. Uh, I personally, um, randomly, always happen to think of this cartoon from, uh, the, I think it was the New Yorker magazine, and this is the first part of the cartoon, and, and, and this is the second um, Lassie is undergoing some trauma therapy, having let his owner drown. Um, anyway, um, but that's not what the word counselor means in, in this um, passage. It's more in the sense of an advisor. Like a king would have counselors advising him on wise governance. And Jesus is a, a wonderful counselor, not in the sense that I might say to our three-year-old, oh, that's, that is a wonderful drawing of an alien. <laughs> It's a drawing of me. Oh, good. Um, thank you. It's not wonderful in the sense of quite nice, but wonderful in the sense of evoking wonder. This is beyond our comprehension. This is wisdom 
unparalleled, beyond anything we can achieve or comprehend. Now, it's worth reflecting on the fact that humanity has progressed a lot in terms of technology in the last 2,000 years. I think this is, this is pretty unarguable. You know, we can now do incredible things, like we can watch cat videos, um, you know, on the phone while sitting on the loo. Um, it's clearly not just me. Um, but in the last 2,000 years, no one has improved on Jesus' moral teaching. If you disagree with me, come and talk to me at the end. But his wisdom is unsurpassed. To the extent that he could say, if you follow my teaching, it's like building your life on a solid rock so that when the storms of life come, as they inevitably will, you will endure. And not only that, it's my experience, the experience of millions of other Christians around the world, that Jesus still guides us today as a wonderful counselor. When I'm dealing with a crisis or just struggling with how to resolve some kind of relationship issue, I find if I pray, if I actively seek Jesus' wisdom, then things generally go better than I expected. Jesus is the one who comes alongside us, God with us as a wonderful counselor. And in a messed up and confusing and difficult world, that is so valuable. And Jesus is not only alongside us as a wonderful counselor, he is a Above us as mighty God. Our reading from John earlier said that through him, through Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Jesus' power is unparalleled. We see this in his adult life through the miracles that he performed. He, he healed people. He turned water into wine. He even raised the dead. And on one occasion, Jesus and his followers were caught in a fierce storm on the Sea of Galilee, and he commanded the storm to be still, and it was. And in fear and amazement, Jesus' friends asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the waves, and they obey him. Now, this is the power of Jesus, the the mighty God, and yet we heard in our last reading from Philippians, that although Jesus is far above us, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being born in human likeness, in shame and humility to a teenage peasant girl in Bethlehem, surrounded by animals and their poo, and visited by unimportant, smelly shepherds. I mean, why shepherds? Shepherds are only helpful in postnatal care if you are a sheep. Even more than this, Jesus had all the power of heaven at his disposal as mighty God. As a man, he surrendered that power and he humbled himself even to death on a cross so that he could take on himself all of the pain and the sin and the brokenness of our hurting world and allow it to break him. God, who was far above us, willingly stooped down to us. And he stooped and he stooped until he allowed himself to be crushed by us for our healing, for our forgiveness. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. God alongside us as the wonderful counselor. God above us as the mighty God, yet beneath us as a suffering servant. And then he embraces us as the everlasting Father. Now, in his teaching, Jesus told many short stories or parables, and probably the most famous um, it is generally known as the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, the author, Charles Dickens, considered this to be the finest short story ever written. And in this story, a wealthy man who represents God has two sons. And the younger son comes to the father and says, Dad, Give me my inheritance now, which is basically the same as saying, Dad, I wish you were dead so I could have some fun. It's an appalling act of rudeness. It should have got nothing more than a clip around the ear and doing the dishes for the next month. But instead, 
the father sells some of his estate. He grants the younger son his wish. And the younger son goes off to a far-off land and he blows all his fortune on wild partying and general debauchery until suddenly he's got nothing left. And he's forced to take a job feeding pigs. Feeding pigs. Jesus was talking to Jews. You know, that's the equivalent of, for us of him getting a job, you know, manually unblocking fatbergs from the sewers below London with no protective equipment. It is the, just the most revolting, disgusting thing. It's the lowest of the low. He's hit rock bottom. So he decides to return to his dad and see if his dad will take him on as a hired servant. So the younger brother starts on the road home knowing he deserves nothing other than to be driven out of town and he is astonished and overwhelmed that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. The father has been watching the road every day for his son's return. And in the culture of the day, he absolutely humiliated himself by running down the road to embrace his stinky, filthy, wastrel son. If you were a man, a man of means and status in that culture, you did not run. And yet the father ran. Uh, and this, which is beautifully depicted by an artist called Charlie Mackesy, this, for many Christians, is the supreme, the defining image of the love of God the Father for us. This love which runs and which embraces, which ignores the stink and the dirt and the wasted inheritance and throws a huge party to celebrate the lost son's return. It's unimaginable love. And Jesus is saying this is how Father God loves even people who have categorically messed up their lives. But you might say, well, that is, that's all very lovely, but I am not like that younger son. I try and do the right thing. I work hard. I keep the rules. I, I try to care for my family. I don't cheat on my taxes. You know, I'm, I, I'm a good person. Well, the father in the story had two sons, and the elder son we would definitely consider to be a good person, yet he is furious when his younger brother returns. He refused to go into the celebratory feast. That was a huge snub to his father. The father goes out again, this time to the older brother, and he pleads with him to come in. I've followed your rules, shouts the older brother. I've done the right thing all my life. I've worked hard. What about my feast? The anger of the, younger, the older brother, sorry, it fundamentally comes because he is insecure. He is fearful. He is jealous. He can't stand to see the love lavished on his brother because he would rather feel like he earned his way into the father's good books. And the father gently corrects him. He says, eh, you don't earn my love. You've always had it. From before you were born. Before you did anything for me. Come, Come into the feast, the father says. Excuse me. Come into the feast, the father says. Come in and celebrate my generous love, the love of the everlasting father. Now, we don't know how the older brother responds. That is where the story ends, with the invitation just hanging there in the air. <clears throat> Jesus is Emmanuel. He's God with us. He's alongside us as the wonderful counselor. He's both above us and below us as the mighty God who created the whole universe, yet allowed himself to be crucified by us for our wrongdoing. 
He embraces us with the love of the everlasting Father. And finally, he longs to enter our hearts as the Prince of Peace. Now, it doesn't really need spelling out that the world is facing rather a lot of challenges at the moment. We've been in a pandemic for nearly two years now, and we still have no idea when or how it will end. The reality and the threat of climate change grows ever more apparent. The inequality between the very richest and the poorest people on the planet continues to increase. And along with all of that, there is the constant drumbeat of wars and terrorism and droughts and famine and all the multitude of tragedies, large and small, that fill the news and occupy our hearts and our minds every day. Where is God in all of this? He is with us. You see, because in Jesus at the first Christmas time, he entered into our world in all its brokenness and pain so that he could experience it himself. You know, in poker terms, Jesus went all in. Jesus knew grief. He knew betrayal. He knew frustration. And in his death, he knew excruciating agony. And yet he took all of this on himself. And then he defeated it when he rose from the grave. And that's why when he appeared to his disciples after he had risen from the dead, he said, peace be with you. It's a peace that doesn't necessarily avoid difficult circumstances, but it instead transcends them. It's a peace that comes from trusting in the one who surrendered the glory of heaven for a smelly manger, who traded a crown for a cross, but who rose again from the dead and will one day return to put everything right, to wipe away all our tears, our mourning, our pain, to make all things new. To know Jesus is to know the Prince of Peace in your heart. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, God beside us, guiding us as the wonderful counsellor, the mighty God who both created us and gave his life to save us, the everlasting Father who embraces those who are broken and welcomes those who are insecure and stressed and fearful, and he's the Prince of Peace who gives us a sure and certain hope in our hearts that our future is safe with him he is god with us and why because of love it's a love that far surpasses any human love it's a love that stretches from beyond the furthest star right down to a tiny newborn baby sleeping in a manger filled with hay. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. May we know God with us. May you know God with you in all of his wisdom, power, forgiveness, peace, and above all, love this Christmas time and always. Amen.
Well, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you to those of you here in church. Thank you to those who've been watching online. And a huge thank you to all who have taken part, uh, both those up the front and those behind the scenes making it all work as well. Just a few notices before we close with our final carol. Uh, and there are even pictures to go with them. Uh, so we're hoping at the moment to have two Chris Dingle services uh, here on Christmas Eve at 3.30 and 5 o'clock. And hopefully they're, they're exactly the same service, but hopefully having two just allows a bit of space. Um, if things change between now and then, um, please just keep your eye either on our Facebook page or on our mailing list. Um, let us know if you'd like to join that. Um, email us at admin. Um, admin at sjnm.org um, and we'll let you know if anything changes but we're planning uh, to go ahead both in person and on the live stream at the moment and that's a great service to invite friends and family to uh, sorry <laughs> then also christmas day again we hope we'll be here at 10 30 in the morning to celebrate jesus birth uh, together and everyone is very warmly invited it'll be a short service um, to celebrate christmas uh, suitable for all ages again the other thing we would just love to plug is the Alpha course that we will be starting in January. And Alpha is a wonderful opportunity to explore the Christian faith. Uh, it's 10 weeks of food and nice conversation, watching some short videos together and then talking about what is it all about, this Christianity? Who was Jesus? Is he of any relevance to my life? What does it all mean? Um, uh, and again, you are invited to that if you'd like to know more. Um, if you're here in person, do chat to Matt or I afterwards, uh, or if you're watching online, do drop us an email uh, to the address on the screen, and we'd love to tell you more about that. We're going to close now with a final blessing before we sing our last carol. So may the eagerness of the shepherds, the joy of the angels, the perseverance of the wise men, the obedience of Joseph and Mary, and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas. Would you know the wonder of Emmanuel, God with us? And with the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love now and always. Amen. <laughs>